now, now or never. All right, um, good evening. Welcome to the City of Montpelier Development Review Board. It is October 4th. We are getting underway. My name is Kate McCarthy. I am the chair of this board, and I'd like to start by introducing the other members, starting with to my right. Uh, I'll have you use your microphone now. Yeah, work. we couldn't hear you at all, Kevin. Let's yeah. try that again. Yeah, Kevin O'Connell, uh, board member. Great, and I'll go through um, based on who's on Zoom and just have you introduce yourself, starting with Rob, please. Hello, it's Rob. Rob. Claire. Hello, this is Claire Rock. Claire. Jean. Hey, Jean Leon, Hi, board Jean, member. Hey. How are you? Abby. Hi, Abby White. Abby. And Michael. Good evening, Michael Lazorczak. Good evening, thank you board members and welcome. And I also would like to introduce and appreciate our staff. Um, to my left, would you like to introduce yourself? Mike Miller, planning director. And then joining us by Zoom is Meredith, if you'd like to say hello. Meredith Crandall, thank you for dealing with this. I'm gonna be off camera tonight just to make sure I actually don't, well, try to keep from bumping off. Okay, all right, thank you for, for making, making a point of being here and. We're glad to exercise flexibility. All right, so the first thing we are going to do, um, because we are in this hybrid world, we're gonna have the staff review of remote meeting procedures and process. And I believe for that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Yes. Okay. Mike, you're gonna have to get really close to the microphone. All right, especially with the mask on. And it's being slow. There we go. All right. So for those viewing this meeting via ORCA, uh, you can participate in the Development Review Board meeting via the Zoom platform through either video and telephone access options. So the agenda and meeting materials, you may I've been skipping that part, Mike, and just focusing on how to access and how to interface via Zoom right now. Okay. So you can download and complete. Uh, so are you just skipping right to the next one? To participate. Oh, for those viewing this meeting via ORCA, got that one. There's your contact information. If the, I guess the key is if you have any problems accessing this meeting, please email Meredith Crandall at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. So the agenda and meeting materials, um, you can download the meeting material packets at this site, uh, which is at the city website. Uh, you can find tonight's meeting in the current and upcoming events. box and then use the download to pull down the files column or click the link on the meeting and navigate between the agenda and meeting files using the tabs at the top of the new window. And I guess that was it for that. Good. I um, think yeah. I think the only other thing we typically like to say is that if for some reason someone is not able to access the meeting by the Zoom platform then we are obligated to continue the meeting to a time and date certain to ensure that access. Uh, it would also be good to mention that um, they, uh, participants can join by telephone. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel your thunder, Mike. Thank you. We don't have anybody on uh, remotely other than DRV members tonight. Um, so I think the, the key was to make sure ORCA member or people watching via ORCA could see how to log on tonight. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All set, Mike. Yep. Thank you. It. Thank you. All right. So the next item on the agenda is the approval of agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. There's a motion by Kevin. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second by Claire. Um, I will call the roll, which we do when we're doing hybrid. Um, Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Claire? Yes. Abby? Yes. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. 
and have, uh, and and I also <coughs> vote yes. Um, have you on there twice there, Kevin? Um, we've approved the agenda. Thank you. Um, there are no comments from the chair this evening. Um, what we'll do next is approve the minutes of September 30th, or no, I'm sorry, September 20th, which was our last meeting. Are there any corrections or modifications to the minutes? Um, there was one thing that I noticed and wanted to check. Um, on page three of the minutes, it talks about how the new residents proposed at zero Ewing could block, in the minutes, could block 81 Ewing solar panels. And I seem to recall that we have talked about solar access, but not about solar panels. Do other, do board members recall what the discussion was? I wanna have it reflected in the minutes properly. We talked about solar gain through the windows on the, East side of the house, I think. I can go back to the recording okay. and double check that. Okay, so Meredith will double check that. So pending confirmation of that piece, are, um, are there any other modifications to the minutes or a motion to approve them? I'll make, I'll make a motion to approve with that clarification made based on Meredith's review of the recording. Motion by Claire, is there a second? Second. Kevin, I'll call the roll. Kevin. Yes. Rob. Yes. Claire. Yes. Abby. Yes. So wasn't there and I vote, I vote yes. So we have approved the minutes of um, September 20th. Thank you. All right, um, we are going to move on to our only item of business this evening, which is zero Ewing Street. Um, this is a continuation from September 20th of a site plan review of a new three dwelling unit structure. Um, folks recall there were some outstanding issues on which the board sought additional information after hearing from the applicant and other interested parties. So um, here's, here's how I'd like to proceed. Um, I'd like to hear an overview of the status of the project from Meredith, kind of where we are procedurally and what issues we have left to, to cover. Um, and then I want to go through each of the outstanding issues in the order that they appear in Mer Meredith's staff memo. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a preview. For those who don't have the me memo handy, the order we're going to follow is access and circulation, solar access and shading, stormwater, landscaping and screening, outdoor lighting, steep slopes, and fences and walls. And um, what I propose to do for each of these items in order to be thorough, but also efficient, um, I'd like to have Meredith briefly queue it up, then have the applicant briefly present any new information. Board members will then get to ask questions to help understand how the relevant part of the zoning is or isn't met. Um, and then those who've been sworn in and wish to speak may also do so briefly. So it'll be a little bit of a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, everyone will get to participate. Um, at this point, I'm, the board is really only looking for new information or new responses because of new information presented. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive record from our last meeting and also a lot of evidence in our packet. So um, that, that's the approach I would like to take. Um, board members, does that work for you? Yes, it does. Okay. And does that make sense to other participants? Okay, and I'm going to confirm that there's no one who's joined us on the on the phone. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up, Claire. Appreciate that. Okay, um, I was going to ask if there's anyone who wants to speak who was not sworn in last time, but there appears not to be. We'll keep an eye out. All right. Without further ado, um, Meredith, I'd like to turn it over for you, um, over to you regarding to talk about where we are procedurally and um, where we are procedurally and what we have to cover. Okay. Um, so procedurally, especially for any of the newer members, DRB members, or um, I can't, I don't know who's out in the audience, but um, people who haven't dealt with a continued hearing before, um, we are in a continued hearing. So um, we're still taking evidence. So everything new that came in between the September 20th and now is additional evidence that gets put in the file, as well as anything that is presented during tonight's meeting. Um, 
and, and that'll continue to be the case until the public hearing is officially closed by the board. That could be tonight. Hopefully it could be later. We'll, we'll see how that all works out. Hopefully it'll be tonight. Um, and for everybody who got my memo, which should be everybody here, um, we, I did reach out to um, the city's attorneys and got some guidance about dealing with conditions in the prior subdivision um, permit, that the subdivision permit approval. Um, so that's in the, in the memo, I just went, don't want to dig into the details because we'll do that later, but I did gather that information. We got additional information from abutters, from the applicants, um, from Department of Public Works. So there's a lot more to chew on to hopefully fill in the gaps or questions that the board had at the September 20th hearing. Um, a, a really important item I do want to make sure, and, and Kate, this is something that might um, mess with your schedule a little bit, but I don't think so, is that the applicant does have new information that was was provided today to city staff. So we weren't able to include it in the packet. It'll have to be introduced at tonight's hearing. Um, Mike has that and um, the applicants have that there. Um, Kate, if it works for you, I think maybe that they should introduce that in the relevant portions because it does seem to be broken out. Mm -hmm. It's however you want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and what I can do right now is actually email that all everything in one bunch to the DRB members so that once you download it, you'll have it on your own computers if you need to look at it a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And you can can you include Dylan as well? Uh, yes, I can include Dylan as well. Great. Thank you. And Dylan, do you have a copy of the staff report, the updated memo? Okay, great. And the applicants do as well. Okay. Yep. If not, I, Mike, you might have some extras there. Okay. But yeah, I think yeah, I think they have taken them. Good. Good. Okay, good for. All right. Thank you, Meredith. That, that was helpful. All right. So um let's let's jump right in. The first section on which we are um we have further discussion is section 3010 of the zoning, access and circulation. Um, as Meredith mentioned, we've we've gotten some guidance from city's attorney. So I will as promised, we'll do hear from Meredith, hear from the applicant, questions from the board, and then hear from um, interested parties. So back to you, Meredith, please. Okay. Um, so during the 920 hearing, there's some question about um, the enforceability of a condition that was in the subdivision approval for subdividing this zero zero Ewing lot away from 81 North Street um, about narrowing the curb cut on the 81 North Street side. After conferring with attorney Rue, um, that that is something that is enforceable. It is an enforceable portion of the um, approval, or at least it can be. However, that does not limit the board's ability to approve alternative access options, as long as those alternatives still comply with the zoning regulations and the VTRANS regulations. So there's definitely flexibility here, assuming that an alternative plan could be come up with, could, could come up with that does not require 81 North Street to narrow their side. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's really the gist of everything that went into here. And, the applicant has provided an alternative plan that was just circulated. Um, so I think it probably makes sense for, for us to switch to the applicant at this point, unless you have other things you wanted me to talk about, Kate. Nope, that, that's the overview um, we were looking for. Yeah, let's switch, let's switch over to, um, to the applicant. You could please put up the revised site plan. Don, if you can make sure you're right in that microphone. I'm sorry, I was asking Mike to please uh, put the site plan up on the wall on the screen.
should be that one. That's perfect. Thank you, Mike. All right. I'll just get it. Maybe down just a little bit. Since with the issue is up in the on the Ewing Street side of the top, Can the other down. Way? Yep, that way, please. Okay. Um, after discussions with uh, Corey Line from DPW, um, his recommendation was, and we uh, uh, concur with, uh, creating a four foot wide grass island on the subject property just to the east of the common property line. And to the east of that would be a independent 12 foot wide access for the project. So that meets both the 12 foot minimum required drive and it separates, separates us by a four foot island that uh, was Corey's uh, minimum requirement based on uh, VTRAN sort of guidance of separation. Okay. I'm going to get up and point at the diagram. Okay. So this is the island? Yes, exactly. Okay. And in that case, what we are, you've been hearing my microphone. Um, in, in that case, what we are effective, what, what you're effectively doing is assuring a 12 foot opening on the parcel you're proposing to develop and, um, and that is the parcel we are focusing on. Yes. Okay. And, and the, the other issues are out of our control and off site. Okay. And has the, it, do I see correctly that the site plan has been updated so that it does not draw any conclusions about what's going to be happening on the neighboring parcel? I didn't say uh, no, that. No, that's still, that residual is still there. I probably should have taken that off, but we, I was focusing on our project. So yeah, yeah. If, if the board will please consider it as a, the zero zero Ewing parcel solely. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for, for that proposal. Um, board members, this is uh, your chance to ask questions. And please pipe up because I can only see a few of you on the side there. Um, I have a question about the four foot um, island, grass curved island. Is that is that in keeping with the VTRANS rules? My understanding, yes. The Corey line said that was the VTRANS preference for separating driveways is a minimum of four foot, um, some sort of island. And so we chose to use concrete curb with grass in the middle. Okay. <clears throat> other board members i have another question and so is the is the full curb cut um 28 feet then or is there a curb that is in that four foot kind of island area the there is curbing along ewing street on the what would be the north part of the island but to the east is a 12 foot will be a 12 foot driveway cut. So that would be just the driveway access 12 feet wide to the east of the curbed island. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Thanks. it sound, sounds like the addition of the island makes it so that it's two distinct dr driveway openings instead of two that are next to each other and function as one bigger opening. Exactly. So now we have two, we are reestablishing, you are reestablishing two curb cuts, whereas Correct. currently there is one curb cut. Board members? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it seems to make make all sense to me. Um, I guess the question is, is are, are we cleaning up the requirement to do anything on the, um, shall we say, lot one of the subdivision, North, the North Street parcel? Um, so maybe there's no... Merit. Oh, oh, sorry. Did you want to elaborate, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that because it seems like 
logically going forward, uh, you know, this is going to remove the need for any of the changes on the lock one parcel. Um, I just wanted to confirm while we're here at this, if that was correct. Yeah. So I think um, Meredith has her hand raised and then I'll, so we'll hear from Meredith in response to that question and then go to Claire, whose hand is also up. So Meredith, go ahead. Um, yeah. So Rob, because this is an application for the zero, zero Ewing Street parcel, yep. um, it's not, it's not really in the DRB's purview to worry about whether or not it's cleaning up lot one um, or 81 yep. North Street. Um, at this point, anything dealing with conditions under that subdivision permit, it's it, it would be an enforcement action, which is all my okay. office, basically. So, um, you know, what this did is it solved the solution, you know, solved, solved the problem of making sure that zero Ewing Street has a conforming access. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you. Would you like to? Oh, Rob, did you want to follow up? No, oh, thank you. Okay. Claire, go ahead. Uh, it appears, is it correct? Am I looking at the site plan correct that this curbing would then extend the length of the driveway? Is that correct? The answer is yes. And I was going to address that when we got to stormwater. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Um, um, maybe you could give us a sneak preview. Okay. The, just so we, we understand the full context. The other concern was uh, from a stormwater related issue, the potential for runoff to leave zero zero Ewing and go on to the adjoining property. So what we've chosen to do there is we've got the grading that should take care of that, but to be more cautious, we have a proposed six foot, excuse me, six inch wide, six inch high concrete curb that will extend from the south of the property along the uh, west property line all the way up to and connect to the curbed island up above. That would force any runoff to go to either the catch basins on either the north end or the south end of the parcel. Thanks, John. Claire, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I guess just my other, just a kind of an observation, it's not necessarily a, a question, is that, and maybe it's kind of for a clarification, is that there's no curbing anywhere else along this street. And so this would be the introduction of a new curb in this specific area, but it's not like it's kind of tying into kind of a uniform curbing that exists in the in and along Ewing Street and along the frontage of the subject parcel or along other front yards, right? Yes, sort of. There's there's not a there's certainly not concrete curbing on Ewing at all. There's sort of a lip an asphalt lip, about an inch or two of asphalt that humps up along the edge that tends to direct water along Ewing, but it's not, wouldn't really be uh, called curb. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it just seems like it's, 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 it seems like it's, it's meeting the requirement, but I think kind of from a design perspective seems a little bit random. But if it's meeting the public works requirement, then great. I think that adequately describes it. All right, thank you both. Any more questions or comments from DRB members about this, about this issue? Okay, so Dylan, if you'd like to um, step up to the microphone, please. Um, just uh, since we're starting out the meeting still, just introduce your name and your address and um, then take about two, two to three minutes. Uh, we can't hear. Yeah, is Dylan's microphone on? We'll check that for you. Thank thanks you. for thanks for letting us know. Yeah, we go. It's yeah, good. Yeah, that should work. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, great. Uh, my name is Dylan Woodrow. I own and live at uh, 81 North Street. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Don and Gabe for um, being courteous and gracious to revise their plans. I, I like the creativity and um, I have um, nothing to say to combat this option. Um, uh, just an observation, there is the, the curbing that runs along the uh, northern boundary of the zero Ewing property does have some curbing there. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say that it would be inconsistent with <clears throat> what currently exists. Okay. So that's all I have. Thanks. So we'll, um, we'll have you do the popcorn thing where you sit up and down um, as, as each one goes through, if that's okay. Thanks. All right. Um, in that case, let's move on to the next the next outstanding item, section 3206 of the zoning, solar access and shading. And this is discussed on pages 16 and 17 of the September 20th staff report, if you want to look. So as we did before, we'll start with an overview from Meredith, please. Um, so this is a little bit of a mea culpa for me in that in the initial staff report, I made a mistake in how I was analyzing under this section. Um, we haven't worked with this section much since it was drafted. Mm -hmm. And we definitely haven't worked with it where we're in a small residential area. I think one of the main places we looked at it was the new development out on River Street where there was really nothing nearby. Um, and so I, you know, we took a look at it after Mr. Woodrow's concerns that he raised about how we were analyzing it and send it back to the applicant um, because we didn't actually have the appropriate information to make this analysis in the initial application and they have actually submitted more information. So I think this is the time to hand it back over um, to the applicant. That is fine, thank you. Thank you, Meredith. All right, um, so is there a diagram that, that we're gonna have a look at? And is this the, is, is could you get the shading plan, Mike? Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to start here. Well, I know we could start these, there. That's probably, these. this is bigger scale, so maybe it's right. Okay. So um, if you look at the project uh, building, which is on the right-hand side of the page, there are two heavy dash lines to the left of that. The one sort of in the middle of the page is the shadow that would be cast by that building on the 21st of December at noon. The shadow to the left of that, or the line, so basically you can see since the sun's coming over your shoulder, and that's the line, there's, there's no shadowing whatsoever at noon. Mm -hmm. However, at both nine and three, the left hand, um, the left hand line would uh, be the representation of the shadow impact. And that um, impacts about 36% of the side, and I emphasize the side of 81 um, North Street. Mm -hmm. And then if we could please go to the, uh, the other drawing, we have some cross sections that will be helpful. Okay. Don, while we're switching drawings, both of those lines are at noon on December 21st. No. Nope. The right-hand one mm -hmm. is at noon. Mm -hmm. The left-hand one is at three and, and um, nine and three. I misspoke. I meant to confirm that they're both on, on the 21st on of 21st December. On 21st of December, Okay, yes. the, the shortest day of the year. Yes. So does that mean that we haven't done a lot of these analyses before? Does that, that mean that other days of the year when there is more sun, there will be less time that the side of the building is in shade? Absolutely. Significantly less. Okay, so actually, and I am. I am actually there. Can we can we blow that up a little bit? Yeah. What we have here is the same drawing on the left, but if we can blow up the right side. Maybe one more. No, nope, not the other. It's hard. To <laughs> How about that? Is that getting us closer? Yeah. Go, no, keep going to the right, please. I'd like to show the two profiles. There you go, um, and. And if you go a little bit high, a little, uh, a little bit to the left again, I'm trying to show um, 
no, farther to the other way, right? Okay. Well, you can't show it all. What we're trying to show is there's a hill to the south of the project, mm -hmm. and I arbitrarily added a 20-foot tall tree on top. It, it's really conservative. So as you look at the bottom of these two, uh, in the middle of the project is the height of our 34 feet of the height of our proposed building mm -hmm. above ground. So the bottom is the uh, the shading from uh, um, the bottom is a shading from the from the trees. So there's really no shading on the building on the, Jan the on Dylan's property on the uh, from the trees. So if you add our building, uh, which is in the the vertical line in the middle of the uh, of the drawing, it shades. Um, uh, about 60% of the side of his building on uh, uh, on December 21st at, at the worst case. So that would be at, um, uh, that'd be nine and three and less so of course at noon. And then if, um, if you go up above, so that, I'm sorry, this is just at noon. So at noon, it shades 60% uh, of it. If you go up or down, I can't remember which, up, I guess. Yeah. There you go. So um, here's the case where at 9 and 3 on that same day, December 21, the trees on the hill to the south are more restrictive than the building. So you see the building, the build, our building's in the shade. Um, 81 North Street is in the shade at nine and three. So somewhere in between uh, our impact, you know, plus or minus an hour and a half either way or so, um, our impact, our, our project impacts it. But what we're trying to show here is that the impact is pretty negligible. Um, and in fact, and it's an issue we talk about a little bit later. I mean, it's, it's, we're trying to do an infill and actually the, the distance between these buildings are significant compared to what you'd expect many infills to be in Montpelier. So um, we think that uh, there's some shading, but it's not, uh, uh, and it could be considered adverse, but it's not undue adverse impact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, okay. Um, are there questions from board members? And again, I guess please. Uh, maybe to put it a different way and tell me if I'm right or wrong, Don, but so if, you know, it's, for instance, if you put the building closer to 81 North Street, the driveway on the other side, an alternative, um, there would be much more shading, you know? So in a way you have, by this alternative, um, reduced the amount of shading. <laughs> yes, we have, that's true. Are there other questions or comments from board members? Okay. And, um, and I guess the other thing is we should show that it, that um, the impact shows that there's never an impact on the, the roof. The project doesn't impact the roof of the, the project, um, excuse me, of the joining property. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right, um, Dylan, if you'd like to comment, um, you're welcome to. Okay, thank you're you, welcome. Dylan. All right, um, thank you all. We're gonna move on to the next item, which is section 3009, stormwater. There's information about this on pages eight and nine of our staff report. And, um, and it's Merida. Um, so, I know there was a lot of discussion about the stormwater issues, particularly about how the um, catch basin and the grading for it to the 
at the rear of the parking area the driveway was going to be situated um, as well as the water overflowing and some of those concerns were addressed in the hearing um, but as as Don showed previously because um, I asked him to to bring back and give a little more detail on that I'm and he's done that so I think it's up to I don't know if the board needs to hear more on that at this point or not. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about more details about the catch basin itself, but he did show the additional curbing that was mm -hmm. going to be put in to prevent any overflow from that catch basin running onto 81 North Street. Um, Don, if you'd like to say anything about it. Uh, I mean, basically, we've, we've got the entire side curb. Gabe was willing to do that. Um, and so... Mm -hmm. And we had sort of a double slope on the driveway a little bit, so that makes sure that the, both the catch basins will accept that. The water from behind the building itself and along the front of the wall is graded such that um, that will also go into the catch basin. And finally, there was some mention, I believe, of water coming maybe over the wall, and so we've added a couple of yard drains behind the wall and connected those to the catch basin. So even water coming off the hill behind rather than accumulating behind the wall that will uh, be caught and directed to the catch basin. So we think we've, we've collected everything we can possibly collect on the site. Oh, and of course the roof, the roof water goes into the, into the storm, in storm system anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, questions from the board. Yeah, I, I think what I see is a very clear, uh, clear plan addressing the you know concerns about stormwater, and you can see where everything's going and is accounted for. So, um, thank you for the for the updates. It makes me satisfied. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin and Rob. Anyone else? All right, Dylan. If you'd like to speak to stormwater, you're welcome to. Okay, thanks. All right, we'll move on to the next item. It's section 3203, landscaping and screening. You'll find it on pages 13 to 15 of our last staff report. Um, Meredith, please. Um, yes, so during the September 20th hearing, there was some discussion about the request for fencing and the applicants willing to put fencing up between the new parking area and 81 North Street, but we didn't actually see any plans for that. So since we were continuing the hearing anyway, it made sense to have that added onto the plans and the site plan that Don and, and Gabe just introduced into evidence actually showed that, but it might make, I don't know if any of the other DRB members got a chance to see that. Yeah, let's take a peek at that. Are you bringing that back up, Mike? Yes. Yeah, that would be useful to just show that again. Thanks. We were so drawn to the curb, we forgot to look at the landscape. Yeah. Okay. I describe that. Sure. Um, um, maybe focus on the new parts. Okay. About halfway up the driveway, um, we run into Dylan's paved driveway, sort of about in between our two site uh, shadowing lines. So what we've proposed, and uh, Gabe and, and Dylan talked about it, that a uh, six-foot-tall wooden uh, fence would be constructed along the property line from basically the, the retaining wall in the back, 45 feet up to the point where it, it would uh, intersect with the existing driveway. That will screen, um, generally screen the parking from most of the adjoining property, not all, but most. But by the time you get further north, it's sort of at a, an oblique angle. So we think that's a, uh, a reasonable alternative. 
and we have a sample of that uh, 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 recommended wooden fence. If it, it, I think it's called our fence. In that disc, do you see that, Mike? Is it in that same set here? No, it's a draw. It's a separate, separate uh, photo, PDF. Yeah. Um. Uh, I think it says our fence because it's an example of one in our backyard, <laughs> which we we like. We, well, we had a sample. Table and hold it up. We had a sample of a new one, <laughs> but I thought it'd be appropriate to show that it they actually. The, the I don't see one final grade that. will be it's it's basically a six foot tall uh, wooden fence with uh, vertical boards on the bottom and a little lattice on the top, so it has a nice sort of look to it. Um, it uh, and it grays it's cedar and so it grays over time, so I think it blends in nicely with with the landscape, and will um, will will nice look nice and it's. We have, um, oh, there it is. Um, so I think that sort of would be the end result of a gray tone. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it looks pretty nice on both sides. Okay, very good. Um, thank you. Um, questions from board members about the fence, the proposal? I would just say it looks thought, thoughtfully done appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Um, Dylan, would you like to remark on this section? Thank you. A comment in a second, and I don't know what to do with it from there in Robert's rules, but I appreciate it. Um, all right, that's landscaping and screening, folks. Thank you. Um, the next section outstanding is section 3204, outdoor lighting, pages 15 to 16 of the staff report. Um, Meredith, do you want to queue this up for us? I'm sorry. Oh, yep, it's a question of kids are now getting ready for bed and right outside my door. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the applicants have provided me and in this packet that I provided through additional materials some information on lighting that they're going to be proposing um, because we didn't have that before they're right now what what I what they've sent previously in between 920 and today was um, some really worked out to four different lights ceiling lights um, over the doors and under the porch um, and this goes there's two as well for the basement entrance area so there's one like over where the stairwell goes down so people can see the stairs and then over the door the entryway door um, so they're really security lights <clears throat> um, those were the only two that showed on here there was no lighting in the rear which isn't required um, and it looked like the, the lumen standards all matched up um, and I did follow up with um, Don and Gabe because I wasn't quite sure about whether what they sent was fully shielded. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a diagram in there, but it's teeny tiny. Um, and I think I'm trying to see if this was in my follow-up emails if it got attached, I think it was. Um, Sorry, I'm scrolling down. So at the almost near the end of the packet that I added for new information is the the closer spec sheet um, that goes with the light that they're proposing. And it looks to me like there's some shielding there based on the way the, the light is designed and built. Um, but I was hoping that Don could could confirm on that. Um, you know, and at this point we don't. I don't think this, um, it's, I think it's going to come up to the board whether this still counts as a professional lighting plan. I'm not sure it does. So that might be something that would be a condition of approval um, as long as the board still feels like these are, you know, sufficiently shielded, which I think they are. But the board could, uh, if they're happy with the plan, you know, the information that's here, we could just make sure that we have a professionally put together lighting plan before the permit gets issued. Okay. 
we agree with that entirely. We, uh, the lights that are shown are, are going to be can lights. They're either under the, um, the under the uh, porches, or under the overhang porch. Uh, and so for both entrances, the only, so those would be shielded and you barely see them. The only light that um, we've added is, and I think it was a suggestion of Meredith that is to add a, it would be a, again, a down shielded light, but in the rear near where the, the waste and recycling totes are. Mm -hmm. um, we have requested, but because of your timely reconvening, uh, we haven't been able to get a design. We've requested a, a light designer that uh, typically does these for us uh, to prepare a plan with all the photo photogrammetrics. And we just ask that that be a condition of, if the board approves the project, that it be a condition that we provide that uh, to Meredith's satisfaction prior to issuing a zoning permit. Okay. All right, that's done. Um, great, uh, questions from board members? I don't have any questions. I think that makes sense. That's a good plan. Okay, Claire, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess I just had a question um, uh, on the lighting plan. I guess, um, I guess I would I would put in a, a suggestion to make whatever that condition would be a little bit flexible. I'm just looking at the back parking area and thinking about in the event that the tenants move in and there is a request to put an additional light in the rear of the building in the parking area, um, if there would be you know, an allowance that that wouldn't necessarily require like a site plan amendment to do um, a small thing like that. Hmm. It sounds like there is a proposal already to include a light back there. Um, from the description. So are you, do you mean an additional light in the back beyond what, what was just suggested? Because was there one proposed, there was one proposed on the building in the rear by the trash totes, is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Are you talking about another one? I guess I would just be curious if, if you know, there is a level of flexibility there, if that wall, with that wall and in, in that area in the back could be yeah. quite dark. I see what you mean. Uh, Meredith has her hand up, so I think she is ready to answer this for us. Go ahead, Meredith. Um, so during the building process, if they decide during the building process as things are going up that they want additional lights, um, because changes, you know, as long as what they're proposing is within the realm of what I could approve administratively, then it would be something that I would be able to just make an amendment to the permit because it's not something that would change a condition or something on the permit just to say, hey, we're adding a light. Um, it would just be an update to the lighting plan is the way I would look at that for this, um, as long as everything was in compliance. And then once the building's built and done, it's treated the same as any other, you know, three or more unit apartment building where they have to come to me for an administrative permit. I mean, it's just, we, we can't, can't really treat them any differently. So as during the, like I said, during the construction, they can come to me for some administrative amendments, as long as it's not a material change, which in my mind, adding one light that doesn't put them over and they're nowhere near the total lumen, you know, and this isn't something that, that anybody here is having issues with where we're restricting the lighting because of neighbor complaints or something like that. I wouldn't see that being an issue in most cases, as long as, you know, they're not putting some huge big light on top of the wall in the back or something. Um, that's, so there's, there's processes for doing it. Thanks, Meredith. Um, Claire, do you have any, any follow-up or anything? Okay. No, thank, thanks for, thanks for your question. I know when we're talking about Four to six lights, and then we wonder if it becomes five to seven lights. What happens? Are you back before the board? I think it's it's good for people to know what what process is in place um, to help add up the lumens and make sure you don't go over. Great, thank you for that. All right, any other questions from the board about lighting? All right, so I'll invite Dylan to comment if you'd like. Okay, thanks, Dylan. All right, um, the next item is section 3007, steep slopes on pages five to seven of the staff report. 
um, and I'll, I'll just preview before Meredith does, we did walk through each of these standards last time um, as, as a group. Um, and then Meredith had some analysis regarding removal of vegetation. Do you wanna go ahead, Meredith? Yeah, so this is in response to some post hearing comments that um, Dylan sent um, expressing some more concerns about the removal of potentially mature trees from the site. Um, and I just, I wanted to dig down a little bit so that everybody is clear about this requirement. I mean, one, anything about removal or disturbance of vegetation that is within that section 3007, it really is about removal of vegetation that is on the slopes that are, that are triggering the steep slopes analysis. Um, so the, the, the trees that are being removed to actually build a house, I didn't see that any of those were in the steep slopes area. Um, and even if they were, the, the standard itself is to limit the amount of disturbance and clearing of existing natural vegetation. It doesn't say that can't happen at all. Um, it's saying to, to, to limit it. Um, it's not a, a strict ban. Um, same with the, you know, preserving the distinctive existing natural vegetation. It's not saying that that is something that, that you can't get rid of any of it. It's, it's doing your best to preserve where you can. You know, if we have to save every single tree on a site, then nothing, nothing is going to get developed at all. Um, and there's, so there's a balance built into this standard. Thanks, Meredith. Um, would either of you like to comment on this as the applicant? There is there is one small tree within the steep slopes that would be removed. The other bigger, nicer tree is out in the flat slopes. Mm -hmm. But that, as Dylan had pointed out, that would have to go also. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions or comments from board members? I have a question, Kate. I'm just curious about this, and it, it um, I don't have. I'm not asking because I have an opinion. I'm asking out of curiosity. But did did the applicant look at other configurations of the building, the footprint of the building, to avoid the steep slopes? I looked at a number of designs and Don and I in early stages, you know, tried to look at what we could do to site uh, to get, you know, sort of maximum density on that site. And I think this was the best design. You know, we looked at multiple designs and this was the best that we could find. I mean, certainly you could do something smaller, but if you want to try to get max use out of it. Okay. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, thanks Gabriel. Um, other questions from board members? All right, Dylan, would you like to speak on this one? Okay, thanks. All right, our next and final item is section 3101, Fences and Walls, page four in the previous staff report. Meredith, you'd be so um, Yeah, so this was just a quick little note to clarify because during the September 20th hearing, the applicant did, did confirm that there was gonna be um, a fence on top of the retaining wall at the rear. Um, sorry for hearing my kids arguing. Um, and I just wanted to make clear in here that that is something that the board is authorized to approve as part of the general waiver for a wall that's over six feet. Um, having the fence on top of it, especially because it's a safety feature, does not suddenly create a situation where you're analyzing two different, you know, a wall and a fence. It's really all part of the same structure. That's all that note is. Okay. Thanks, Meredith. And that that requirement for that particular safety feature, does that come from, I don't see it in our zoning, is it a best practice from an engineering perspective or where does that standard come from? 
Yes, um, I, I think it's building code. Okay. And we've always, the practice is that any wall over 30 inches, mm -hmm. um, you have to put a, a fence over it because it's a, it's a potential trip, trip mm -hmm. hazard. Okay. All right. So that, that, you know, that's a common engineering practice. Okay. And what will that top fence look like? Is it going to be shiny and bronze? Is it going to be matte and brown? Uh, what, what do you expect the appearance to be? What roughly? we typically, what we typically spec is a, is a, probably an inch square, uh, slats, mm -hmm. four or five, four inches apart. And then, um, maybe a little decorative part on the, on the top, but it's sort of a standard black, um, steel. Uh, fence. Okay. Kind of. I'm not sure where we have one like it, but I saw one the other day, and now I can't remember where I saw it. But yep. Okay. Thanks, Don. Um, board members, any questions or comments about this this part? I have a question on the wall. Um, this is, this is a clarifying question so I can better visualize what this looks like. So if I was standing in the middle parking space, looking at the wall, the wall in front of me would be, is it eight feet tall? Is that correct? The, in the middle of the wall, it's about six. The highest is the would be to your left at about 45 degrees at the corner. And then how tall would it be at the corner where it is meeting the fence there on the is. joining property line? It's, um, that's where it's eight feet at the, at the corner. And then it's down each direction from there. It steps down. I didn't bring, but there's a full set of drawings that have been submitted uh, with the package. Mm -hmm. um, so that so the wall is is tallest in the in the south west. Well almost due south. Okay. Right at that corner with the with the fence and the neighboring property. No, it's in the middle of the project in the middle of the project would be the tallest. Oh, it okay. To, it gets down to two feet down by that CB. Okay. CBB. And then as you go east from there, it gets higher because if you can see the contours, we, we bump into the higher contours on the hill. Mike, is that, is that why I thought you had that wall up a little earlier. But then and it drops down each direction. I was thinking when you scroll down, it was in that set. Gotcha. So eight eight feet in the middle, kind of at the, the corner, and then it goes down to like two feet on one side and then like two feet on the other on the other side. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Just trying to wrap my brain about how all the pieces fit together in that back. I think they hillside. <laughs> um, it was in the original packet submission. I don't, I, I don't have the original packet. I oh, just okay. have the new one. And the fence, the, the fence that will top the wall will remain at the same height, regardless of the height of the wall. Is that correct? No, the fence will go along with the wall. Okay. So, it, so it'll be three a three foot fence in sections, and it'll step along with the wall. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah, otherwise it would get it would get pretty high. <laughs> Thanks, Claire, um, for clarifying those things. Um, are there other questions or comments from board members about about this section, fences and walls? All right, um, Dylan, would you like to comment? Okay. 
Yeah, I just had a, a question about the construction of it. Will it will it involve any blasting or simply digging with an excavator? Um, we don't anticipate any blasting there. It would just be, um, and you really only you're digging into the hill. We wouldn't expect to have Legionella. You never know, but we wouldn't anticipate blasting. Great, thank you. Thanks for that question. All right, folks, um, we've, we've made our way through the staff report. And at this point, what I'd like to do is invite just any concluding remarks um, from Meredith, the applicant, um, and board members and, and Dylan. So Meredith, concluding remarks or last, last things you want to let us know? Um, so huh, I don't know if I have any concluding remarks unless board members want a rundown of what I think at this point are the open potential conditions of approval that are still sort of out there, but I can do that further down the line as well. Yes, let's let's do that in a couple minutes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, and Don Gabriel. We just like to add a couple things that were added to the site plan as requested by Kurt at DPW. Uh, He's requested that we maintain a silt barrier along the property lines on either side during construction. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, the other question that had come up one other time, that there's a question of whether there potential for gravel driveway for soil to accumulate at the base of the wall. And it's unlikely, but it's possible. And But that would just be addressed in the normal routine maintenance that you'd expect of the property. Thank you. Just like to say uh, thank the board, but especially the staff. You've got a really amazing staff, and Meredith has been incredibly timely. Uh, so thank you throughout the whole process. Thank you, Meredith. You're welcome. Thank you, Meredith, and um, and thank you for for working together. Um, board members, any last questions or comments? Just one side question. Dylan. Um, I just had one comment in regards to uh, the lighting plan um, and maybe just more of a request or recommendation to mitigate extraneous electricity usage and light pollution um, by use of perhaps um, motion sensors for uh, triggering the lights to turn on and off um, just to try to mitigate uh, light spill over to, to my property. Um, but that's all that I would have to say on the lighting piece. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Dylan, can, uh, or Kate, can you repeat what he said? I had a hard time and since I'm sure. part of drafting. Sure. Um, I'll let Dylan speak for himself. Sure. Um, just a, uh, a request or recommendation to mitigate light pollution and extraneous electricity usage to uh, by uh, utilizing motion sensors to turn on the lights when needed um, and have a timer to turn them off when, when not in use. Um, just to mitigate light spillover to other properties. Okay, thank you. We've often done that, um, in which case we'd probably have the lights on. Uh, the motion sensors would kick on it, typically at control them from 10 to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and then have like a, uh, if the motion sensor triggers it, it typically you do a five or 10 minute use time and then they shut off again. That, that's not difficult to do in a control sequence. Thanks. Great. All right. Um, the only other comment we had and Meredith and I had a discussion on this and I, I just wanted to, it's a separate issue, but just wanted to put on the record. Um, I know the planning commission is working on a rewrite of the zoning ordinance and we would, urge that the board encourage them to look at the inherent conflict of solar shading and infill housing. I mean, it, there was some impact here. Um, we don't think significant, but these properties are a ways apart. And I think that as you try to do more and more housing and infill, that's gonna be a conflict and it, you have to pick your priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I just we need to be aware of that uh, that conflict. Yeah. 
no, thank you for that point. Thank you for bringing it to Meredith's attention and hopefully it's something that our legis legislative body can deliberate on. Um, but no, I, I, I appreciate that a uh, zoning ordinance is about decisions and priorities and optimization of community good and, and individual property rights. So um, it's a dance and it's good to refine that based on our community's goals. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so Meredith, at this point, um, I would, in, unless board members have any other questions, I'd welcome your overview of what you see as the conditions at this time. And, and for board members and others reference, you, you recall that our staff report at the end, pages 19 and 20, has a set of proposed conditions. Um, and that may be what Meredith is going from. So if you want something to look at, um, that's where to look. So yeah, go ahead, Meredith. Yep. Um, so um, I'm also, I'm looking at above that as well, where there were outstanding issues and things that the board had to make determinations on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do have to say that um, I would feel better in drafting the decision um, if the board made a formal determination about the solar access and shading. Um, that is one thing where I just want to make sure that the board's clear about approving it or not in relation to the regulations and the provision and the language that's there. Um, so that's one item that is still outstanding, I think, for the board to be clear on. Um, and then the other potential, you know, just about everything else, I think there was enough information provided that a lot of those other one through eight determination issues are dealt with. Um, and then for other conditions, I think we still have the re requiring a certificate of compliance um, after the build that will, among other things, confirm the um, ob obtaining that energy certificate. So that was the um, condition Roman numeral one. And then out of the um, within 30 days of the decision condition that was in there, the only thing left there that has not been provided as of this evening is the formal outdoor lighting plan compliant with B204. Um, all of those submissions that I emailed to everybody and that, that got shown, we have the final EPS um, C plan. We have that proposed site plan that shows the internal pedestrian walkways as well as the new fence um, and the curbing and the other stormwater details. So all of those other things got dealt with. So right now I have really two conditions on approval is what I have left. And then the board making a clear determination about compliance under um, 3206, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, the only other condition that I have noted is a modification of the site plan so that the conditions of 81 North reflect the actual conditions on the ground today rather oh, than- Oh, yes. Yep, so a final site plan. Thank you. That's another thing that should happen before the permit is issued. Thank you very much, Kate. She brought up a problem, if I may, or an issue that was requested for by uh, Kurt Monica and we added, and I forget, failed to bring it up, is that out in the front walk, just below the stairs, we have a 90 degree turn to the west that would allow people to come down the walk, continue on this walk to the driveway and get back. Otherwise, I think Kurt pointed out that he was looking like people were gonna have to walk out into the street and come back in. So right. that, that roughly didn't make any sense. So this gives us a connection to the parking, to the driveway, to the parking in the rear. Great. And that is in the plan. I just failed to note that. Okay, good. Thanks for highlighting that. That's helpful. All right, great. So um, at Meredith's recommendation, I would like to return to the solar access and shading section. Again, pages 16, 17 in the staff report um, to review the standards thoroughly. So the, the specific provision that we're looking at here is the 3206C that's specifically about the solar access and shading. Mm -hmm. 
um, that says the proposed development shall not shade existing yards, walls, or roofs oriented within 15 degrees of true north, or sorry, true south on abutting parcels to a greater than extent than a hypothetical 25 foot high wall constructed on the property line between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. on December 21st. And so um, Don and Gavis have come back um, with their solar shading diagram and other information to try and show that. Okay, so the, stan the standard is not to shade existing yards, walls, or roofs. We've confirmed that the roof is not shaded. Um, uh, forgive me if I missed this when you're presenting the diagram, but the orientation within 15 degrees of true south, that, that's the angle that you were, you, you showed us the shade angle, but could, could you explain the 15 degrees of true south? Is, are they overlapping in that way? No, I can't explain that. Okay. It, it, both build, the way I interpret that, that neither building is within 15 degrees of true south unless it's the shading, I, I guess I don't understand that. Yeah, relative to what, I guess yeah. is the well, question. I, I mean, it, I understand what 15 degrees is, yeah. but what's it mean? Does the building not be in there or is that the only place we're worried about shading? I um, mm -hmm. will respond to it if we can understand it. Okay. Meredith, do you have more information than Don or I? About um, <laughs> and this is why I misinterpreted it to begin with. Um, I think, and Mike may have to step in here because he was part of the process in drafting all this. I think the it's that 15 degrees of, of true south aspect um, gets a little odd. I think what that means is that the 15, the oriented, um, sorry, I'm scrolling back up, sorry, the exact, oriented within 15 degrees of true south means that the building that is being shaded, right? The shadow is falling upon a structure that has a surface that is oriented in that prime area of fifth, within 15 degrees of true south to capture sunlight. Um, it's something that gets really odd because just about any wall or any wall to the north of the new structure is going to be oriented within 15 degrees to of true south, unless it's a different side of the building. I, I think. Um, let me see if I can. I'm worried about sharing screen. I'm going to try. Okay. Um, well, and if it bumps can, me off, I'll be right back. Yeah. Well, while you share this, the screen. Oh. I will. I will note that one of the purposes of this you, section. Right is that proposed development does not unreasonably reduce the ability to use solar energy on neighboring properties. And solar energy can be active as collected through a solar panel. It can be passive um, gained through windows. So as we interpret this, I think we would do well to keep in mind the overall purpose that we are trying to achieve, which is to not unreasonably reduce solar energy. Um, Mike, do you have what, further insight on this? Uh, not a whole lot more um, other than what you see. I was here when this was proposed. It wasn't um, something that was uh, abundantly clear, but we thought the, the picture kind of shows a lot. It's kind of formulaic. Um, so the idea is that you were meant to, if, and if you had a, pr a parcel that was north, south, east, west, it's really easy for you to orient north. Um, as far as I could see on our on what we were looking at for this this parcel, I thought Ewing Street was to the would have been to the north of the building, and 81 North Street would have been to the west. But um, and I think this diagram was intended to be looking at your northern property boundary. Now, of course, if you've got a kitty cornered property, you're going to end up with a, a more difficult shading to, to, to do. But the idea is, according to our consultant, um, you would put a, a hypothetical 25 foot, um, there'd be a 25 foot wall on the, on the, the southern 
boundary, and then you'd measure the distance back. In this case, in this example, it's 20, it's 10 feet. So there would be at 12 noon, some shade that would eclipse a 25 foot um, wall because the building in this case was 33 feet tall. Okay. So you would do this formula to determine whether or not you met the requirement. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I think that all makes sense to me, except that this building is to the east of the existing building, not to the south of it. So if the if the objective is to make sure we're not blocking southerly exposure, I think that objective is met since the building is not south of 81 North Street. So maybe I'm going a little too far afield here. Well, I think. Yeah, I mean, I. I look at it that way. I look at it regulations designed to protect um, walls from being shaded that are within 15 degrees of true, th true south. That's what I see. You have to have some restriction on which wall you're protecting. You're not going to protect a, uh, a wall that's north facing. I mean, yeah, that's so how I see it. Board too. members, it's our it's our job to determine that the purpose of this section is met. Um, we have received a solar shading diagram. We have seen the impact on the east east wall of eighty one north. Um, I'm satisfied that the purpose of section thirty two oh six is met um, by the design by the site design and described by the analysis presented to us. Do other board members wish to add or comment? No, I would concur with your comment. I, I agree, I agree. I'm satisfied with the applicant's site design and analysis as well, in the presentation of the engineering plan. Thank you, Jean. All right. Um, Meredith, I think that completes our analysis of that section. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for hi highlighting it. All right, board members, is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, um, I would like to entertain a motion. Uh, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing on Double zero Street application. Kevin, if you're I talking, could you get closer to the microphone, please? We can't hear. We can't hear. I'm hard. I'm hard to train. Uh, I'd like to make the motion to close the public hearing on Double Zero Ewing Street, and uh, the board would reconvene in uh, deliberative session at the close of the public meeting. Yes, at the close of the public meeting. Thank you, Kevin. We have a motion by Kevin. Is there a second? <clears throat> we'll second that. Second from Jean. Is there any discussion? A reminder for newer board members, this means that we will no longer collect evidence on this on this application, but feel that we have what we need to issue a decision. Okay. And just a reminder, we we are doing this with all applications, be they small or large, uh, during this uh, pandemic time. Very good. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'll call the roll. Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Claire? Yes. Abby? Yes. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. I vote yes as well. We will take this up in deliberative session at the close of the public meeting. Um, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Um, it's work, it's conversation, it's relationship building, it's time, and I appreciate all of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Where's my agenda? Um, yep. So, folks, we're 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 still in we're still in the meeting. Just with, the mics are still on, so that's okay. Um, thank you. All right. Um, item eight here is other business. Um, the next meeting is October 18th. Is that confirmed, Meredith? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to 
do our deliberative session on Zoom because I hadn't set that up yet. Oh, you need to stop. Okay. So Meredith will be sending us a deliberative session link for board members to participate. And um, do we have material? Uh, do we have applications for October 18th? Yes, we do. We do. Okay. So there will be a, a meeting on October 18th. And I think people know that unless unless something transpires, um, this will be my last meeting um, with the DRB. I'm going to be uh, taking a hiatus after about nine years of serving on this board in various capacities, starting as an alternate, moving up to the esteemed positions of regular member, vice president, and for the last or vice chair, and for the last year and a half or so, your chair, um, which has been an excellent experience. Um, and I look forward to sharing the glory with other members of the Montpelier community. So um, I'm going to miss it. You certainly made it better for applicants. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Um, so that's that. Um, thank you all. Hey, may I um, just say a few words? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything particularly prepared, but I just want to thank you for your service and um, appreciate your leadership with the DRB. Um, you know, it's a um, unfortunate that we lose somebody like you serving on a local board, but completely understand the circumstances and your reasons for doing so. But just wanted to say publicly, um, thank you. And I really appreciated um, your service. Thank you, Claire. I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by motion by Kevin, second by Jean. Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Claire? Yes. Abby? Yes. Jean?